Luke chapter 2, turn there with me this morning. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, and there were shepherds. So thankful for uh, the publishing company of The Chosen TV series to give us permission to use their production called The Shepherd as our opener this morning. If you are not familiar with The Chosen, who is familiar with the TV series The Chosen? Anybody in here? Just a few. If you're not familiar with that, it's the first ever multi-season TV show about the life of Jesus. It's being created outside of the Hollywood system and in fact is the largest crowd-funded TV show of all time. You can actually download the Chosen app on your smartphone or on a device, smart device and you can stream it to anything. If you've got an Apple TV or a Roku or all of these other gadgets, Android, any of them, you can stream it for free uh, to, to anything that's got that. You can watch it right on your device. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to see it, I would really recommend you see it. Take time with your family. It's worth it. My kids and my family and I are, are sitting down in the evenings watching the first season. And at the end of every episode, they give you a good hook. And my kids are like, oh, can we watch one more? Please, can we watch one more? It's really, really well done. Probably the best uh, biblical production that I've ever seen. Uh, and it all started with the shepherd that we watched at the beginning of the service. The producer created that to be used in his home church for their Christmas Eve service. And that was the creative spark that launched the whole series. So I'd encourage you to, to check that out. Luke chapter 2, beginning of verse 8, And there were shepherds, shepherds of all people. Dr. Joachim Jeremiah was a German Lutheran theologian, scholar of Near East studies, and a professor at, uh, of, New, of New Testament studies in the 1900s. And he said uh, shepherds in the first century were despised in everyday life. In general, they were considered second class and untrustworthy. Even the religious leaders maligned the shepherd's good name. Rabbis banned they banned pasturing sheep and goats in Israel except on desert plains. And the Mishnah, Judaism's written record of the oral law, referred to the shepherds in belittling terms, calling them incompetent. And another one says, you should never feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. <laughs> they were despised. Jeremiah documents the fact that shepherds were deprived of even their civil rights. They could not fulfill judicial offices. They could not be admitted in court as witnesses. He wrote, to buy wool, milk, or a kid, that is a goat, uh, from a shepherd was forbidden on the assumption that it would be stolen property. So you had to buy it through a middleman. Regarding Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, Jeremiah notes, the rabbis asked with amazement, how could it be in view of the despicable nature of shepherds, how can one explain why God was called my shepherd in Psalm 23, 1? Wow. Shepherds. They were not the top rung of first century Jewish society. Society, society, right. Living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Um, the area that these shepherds that we just watched uh, on screen, were the area that they were shepherding in was called Migdal Eder. It is known uh, as, it means the tower of the flock. It was only about a thousand paces from Bethlehem. And it was a place of elevation where shepherds would go to watch over their sheep. There was literally a tower built there while they watched their sheep that grazed in the valleys, uh, the meadow below. It was a good vantage point and ideal for watching over the sheep and keeping an eye on what might come down the road from Jerusalem. Spanning several generations, it became the place where they raised the unblemished and unspotted sheep used for temple sacrifice. The fields around Bethlehem were valuable grazing lands. 
the priestly shepherds still watched over their temple flock day and night. They were vigilant to protect them from their natural enemies, from the robber, the wolf, the bear, the lion. Migdal Eder, that means the tower of the flock, was constructed as a place for watching over the sheep. On the ground floor, a room was designated for the delivery of baby lambs. Well, that's sort of an, uh, redundant, right? Babies are lambs. Lambs are babies. Um, and for the protection of special lambs. Uh, look at verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. To who? To the shepherds. Not to kings, not to governors, not to Pharisees or Sadducees, much to their dismay, not to royal officials or officers of the court, not even to merchants or tax collectors, shepherds, the lowest rung of their society. Isn't that just like our Jesus? Isn't this typical of what we have been seeing as we progress through the book of Acts? We see God identifying the least likely, the marginalized, the foolish of our day to be the very place in which he chooses to display his glory. How do we know that? Look at the second half of 9. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, but the glory of the Lord shone around them. Around these guys, the same guys that the religious leaders would have nothing to do with, didn't want to touch them, didn't want them in their holy, sanctified place, right? But the glory of God himself was manifest to the shepherds. And they were terrified. I would be too. Look at verse 10. But the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It's an interesting translation in English. It's hard to translate uh, the word there. Bring you good news is actually one word in Greek. Uh, It's euangeliso. It's the verb of good news, the declaration of a new king. God's king come to God's kingdom. Euangeliso. Literally, the angel said, don't be afraid. I'm good newsing you with great joy. I'm good newsing you with great joy that will be for whom? For the most important people among you, right? No. To a very select few, the powerful, the social influencers of your day, that's who I've come for, right? No. I am good newsing you with great joy that will be for all the people. All the people. If you've ever gotten the feeling that you can never do this Christian thing because you just don't fit in with these churchy folks, look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Who is spe- who, who is the angel speaking to? To the shepherds, the lowest of the low. The Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He didn't come for people who've got it all together. He didn't come for the elite or the prestigious. He came for the humble and lowly in heart, for the repentant and the contrite of spirit. Verse 12. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Have you ever considered that verse? We say it a lot as we're reading the Christmas story. This will be a sign to you. 
you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths, and lying in a manger. That's a weird sign. Why is that a sign? And to whom is it a sign? Mangers in the first century were feeding troughs, of course, uh, but they weren't wooden troughs like we usually depict in our, uh, in our nativity sets in the West, right? Um, in ancient Israel, they were made of stone, and they were like carved out of the stone, of a softer stone. Um, and so there was a section, like a, a scoop essentially, dug out of a stone, carved out as a place to put the feed, but these nooks were also used to protect little lambs. And these were the little lambs that, of Bethlehem that they were famous for at Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock, to keep these special sacrificial lambs safe and unblemished, they would wrap them in swaddling cloths and they'd place them in one of these mangers, these stone carved out mangers, to keep them safe so they would stay unblemished and fit for the sacrifice. for preparation and protection for the day of their sacrifice. This will be a sign to you, shepherds. You'll get this picture. No one else will get this picture, right? To whom else would this have been, what made any sense? Only to these particular shepherds, the lowest of the low, who were preparing the unblemished sacrifice for the sin offering of Israel. This will be a sign to you because when they walked in, they would totally understand wrapped in swaddling clothes and in a manger in preparation for a day of sacrifice. Reminds me of John the Baptist's words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They knew, these shepherds knew what the cloths and the manger meant. This detail wouldn't have meant anything to anyone else, but God chooses the humblest among us to reveal his grandest plan in the most personal way. This long-expected king wasn't headed to a palace. No, this king was headed to a sacrifice. The voluntary sacrifice of himself on the cross for your sins and for mine. They knew where the Messiah was born, and they also knew where he was headed. Verses 13 and 14. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Can you imagine being those shepherds on that night and encountering or being encountered by this heavenly display? A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. It's an interesting division. Glory to God in the highest. There's a heavenly aspect of this Redeemer. What was Jesus' purpose in coming to earth? Well, we might say to save sinful humanity. And that would be true. But his first purpose for coming was to bring glory to the Father in heaven, right? Glory to God in the highest. And secondly, peace on earth. 
peace through Christ and his sacrificial death, his burial, his resurrection, his life poured out for you and for me. It reminds me of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This heavenly picture of God's glory completely freed and sh- to shine throughout all of eternity. But what's the next line? Remember? The whole earth is full of his glory. Isn't that amazing? I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple and the whole earth was full of his glory. And we see that same, that same dual aspect here in this passage. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. When the angels had left them, this is verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. Was there ever a time up to this point that anyone would have listened to a shepherd? Not likely. They did not have the ear of the people. But now, empowered with this encounter of the newly born Messiah, no one could stop them from breaking rank, so to speak, and and gossiping the good news of the Messiah to anyone who would hear. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Are you desiring the peace of God in your life this morning? Do you desire for his favor to rest upon you? How do we do that? How do we become like these shepherds, recipients of God's peace, the Prince of Peace, and the favor of God? I think we find it in verse 11. Back up to verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Look at those three words, Savior, Christ and Lord. Savior. A Savior has been born to you. The name Jesus literally means God saves. Run like these shepherds. Run to Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, as your savior. They recognized, can you imagine the despair in which they found themselves, the longing, both personal and national, (laughs) that they felt in this century, just before the birth of the Messiah. They desperately needed a savior more than they even imagined. 
They thought they just needed a political savior. But it was so much, so much deeper than that. So how do we lay hold of this peace and this favor? I think the first thing is like the humble shepherds, we run to Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, as your savior. What's the second word there? Who is Christ? That's the Greek word for the Hebrew word, Messiah. Christ and Messiah are equivalent words in Greek and in Hebrew, and each has the connotation of the anointed one or the promised one. This anointed one, this Savior who is coming is not just a political Savior like you've seen in the past. Remember the Maccabean rebellion who rose up and cast off some of their political constraints for a short season. This isn't like one of those guys, right? This is the promised one, the anointed one, the one who was foretold since way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Christ, the Messiah. So first we run to Jesus as the sacrificial lamb, our Savior, the payment for our sins, the blood payment that is required for the payment of our sins. And secondly, we recognize that he alone is the promised one, the Messiah. And he alone has the authority to pay the price for the sins of the world. What's the third word? Lord. Lord. What does Lord mean? It means sovereign. It means king. It means ruler. It means boss. Right? The guy who gets to tell you what to do in every aspect of your life. Run to Jesus as your Savior, yes. Recognize that he alone is sufficient to save you from your sins and receive him as Lord of your life. It's one thing to say, Lord, it's one thing to say, Jesus... I'll take your saving, thank you very much, and then just go about my life however I want to. But that's not the message given by the angels. A Savior is born to you, yes, he will rescue you, but he is Christ the Lord. And his proper place in your heart and in your life and in my heart and in my life is on the throne the ruling center of my life, over every aspect, every area of my life. Run to Jesus as your Savior, recognize him as the Messiah, and receive him as your Lord. How do we do that? That's the process that Scripture indicates called repentance. It's just a 180-degree turn. I've been living life for myself and I choose to submit my life and my will to confess all known sin and the right to run my life independently of God. And I submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Repentance is that 180 degree turn and faith is, if, if uh, repentance is laying myself down at his feet and submitting to his lordship, faith is the receiving, forsaking all, I trust him. I lay hold of the promise that he has given. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He alone is the promised one, and he has the authority to do it, and he's faithful. He'll do it every time. When we turn our life to him and confess our sin, he's faithful to forgive. Not only forgive everything we've done in the past, but cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
We actually become recipients of the righteousness of Christ himself. Not because of our good works or of anything that we've done to achieve it, all because of Christ's accomplishment on the cross. So as we celebrate this week, the first advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep in mind his his ultimate destination. What was Christ's ultimate goal, his ultimate destination? Where was he heading ultimately? Was Was his final destination the manger? No. He took it to the cross. But did he stay on the cross? No. He was placed in the tomb. But did he stay in the tomb? No, that wasn't his final destination either. Where did he go? To the throne, the right hand of God the Father, exalted as the Most High. But did he stay there? Well, yes, in a sense. And yet, he poured himself out by his Spirit that he might take up residence in you and in me and in all who will repent and believe. His final destination is your heart and in mine. Until that glorious day of his second advent, when we are all united with him face to face. Amen.